On this day, there is little in the way of wind in the Windy City. Instead, it's sunshine overload at Buckingham Fountain in Chicago's Grant Park. Known for its deep dish pizza and its brutal winters, what's lesser known is that Chicago is the epicenter of a study that is unlike any other in the world. 30 minutes from downtown Chicago is Sacred Heart Monastery in Lyle, Illinois. Home to 22 Benedictine sisters, nuns. Theirs is a life of prayer, community, service, and chores. Okay, now follow me. Okay, come on. Bum, bum, ba -dum, bum, bum. My name is Sister D. Paul Stava. I'm 88 years old, and I'm the third oldest in this community. While Sister DePaul delivers the mail, 83-year-old Sister Lois Jean helps get ready for lunch. I ran nun for 66 years. Along with morning prayer and mass and volunteer work, all done together in community, these sisters and some nearby priests have another title as well, research participant. I always felt like I wanted to do something uh, to uh, help people. And um, when they said that this was uh, uh, a research program, and I, I know my dad um, had Alzheimer's, I think. We didn't call it that at that time. But um, I always felt so bad because he was like a different person when, when this happened to him. Eighty-seven-year-old sister Christine Kuba is one of 1,500 nuns and priests across the country who have been research participants in the religious order study from Rush University in Chicago. I feel um, that it's a contribution to help people out that um, have the disease. I feel very bad about that disease. I think it takes away your humanness. Emory University is a collaborator in the landmark 25-year-long study. The amount of information that can be collected now in days is what we used to collect over a decade. <laughs> 10, 20 years ago. Yeah, actually, let's go, let's go to the other one. It's not going to be figured out in one person's lab. It's going to be a team. Um, somebody will look to see if the person had Alzheimer's dementia. Dr. David Bennett is the director of Russia's Alzheimer's Disease Center and leads the religious order study, which began when he was inspired by an earlier study done on older nuns. Participants in the religious order study begin taking part at 65 years old and includes nuns and priests. We love the idea of working with the nuns, priests, and brothers. They live communally. They have spent their lives, you know, um, committed to the benefit of other people. And here we could offer them the opportunity to continue that giving after they're dead. As a wise person once said, growing old isn't for sissies. My name is Sister Josephine Callis, and I am 93 years old. 95. What? <laughs> 95, that's right, thank you. You are just gonna stand here. I'm going to press a button on a remote. So I'm gonna have you do that one one more time. Every year, researchers come to Sacred Heart to test the nuns, running them through a battery of cognitive and neurological tests. I want you to tell me all the animals you can think of in one minute. Ready? Begin. Horse, mule, donkey, cow, lamb, sheep, goat, dog, cat, um, mouse, giraffe, camel, um, so now I want to see if you can identify different smells. Hmm. 
hard to tell. I, I think rose. The tests are not easy. It's always very interesting how much you can, uh, how you would say, decline from what you did last year. Uh, you don't, you don't realize that until when you go through this program how much you can forget. So now we're gonna do that same thing with your left hand. Across the street at St. Procopius Abbey, 85-year-old Father David Turner goes through the same testing each year. Okay, that'll be fine. When I saw a possibility of me contributing to research, that's why I signed up and, and have been part of this program. Now I'm going to name three objects. In this study, nuns account for just over 70% of research participants. So Priests two, make up 30%. I'm gonna go ahead Fewer than 10% are minorities. Okay, she's here because her chair is here and she puts the dishes away, come on. <laughs> there is something else all these nuns and priests agree to when they sign up. This little thing right here is critical for the way we encode memories. Brain donation after death. And how do you feel about that? I'm dead. What do I care? <laughs> yeah, you could have my brain. Sister DePaul loves to entertain. My nickname was Skinny when I entered because I was 98 pounds. Through humor <laughs> and her harmonica. <laughs> the research is showing that her positive outlook on life could help protect her from dementia. You're funny. <laughs> Thank you. When people die and we get the brain, okay, our, our responsibility to them and to the funders is to ensure that it has maximal uh, possibility of helping other people. And so to do that, we have to save the brain tissue in a variety of different ways uh, that make it useful for a variety of different studies. And for a study that started 25 years ago, um, to have the brain saved in a way that it can be useful for technologies far in the future. There's gray and white matter, right? And so you can see the different color. Emory Brain Health's Dr. Alan Levy and Dr. Bennett take us on a tour of the freezer farm at Rush where the brains of the nuns and priests are stored and used for research. But this is like the hard drive where memories get formed. The synergy of all the minds and talents of people working together, you know, give insights that we otherwise just wouldn't be able to make. The brains, stored at negative 80 degrees Celsius in freezers with backup generator systems, are scanned, preserved, and frozen. They are also examined for hemorrhages or tumors or signs of neurodegenerative diseases. You can move your arm. All of the data compiled from this research and the year-to-year -year exams of the nuns and priests has led to some fascinating conclusions about why some of us stay sharp until the end of life and why some of us begin declining in our 60s. Genetics play a role. Some people inherit genes associated with the disease. And most of these brains are filled with the plaques and tangles associated with Alzheimer's disease. But not all the people who had these brains developed Alzheimer's. See some of the blood and that is problems. where research is proving that lifestyle factors can help compensate, delay, and prevent dementia. We have a structured prayer life. In addition to annual cognitive and neurological testing, the nuns and priests are also interviewed about their lives, their upbringing, education level, musical or foreign language abilities, traumatic experiences, social activities, and their personality. <laughs> the picture that has developed from all of this research shows several lifestyle factors are critically important. Let us pray. The more engaged people remain throughout their lives, the more protection they have against dementia. Being cognitively active, physically active, and socially active, People often ask me, oh, what cognitive activity should I do? And what I tell them is two things. One is do varied activities, do different things, um, and do things that you like, all right? Because you're more likely to do them. Spa, si, ba. Spa, si, ba. Knowing a second language can delay dementia by up to four years. Musical training, 
another type of language is also protected. Purpose in life, so having a goal and intentionality that guides what you do, this is, this is kind of in the fabric of some people, and, um, and it seems to protect you from everything. You're less likely to die. Religious order participants have unending purpose. I have never met a retired nun. Um, I mean, if they retire from job one, they're doing job two, and if they retire from job two, they're doing job three, and they are working and active and busy until they can't. Having a social network, people you feel comfortable confiding in, also protects you from cognitive decline. Bennett and his team are also studying the MIND diet, which is heavy in leafy green vegetables and berries and nuts and fish. There's no doubt that people that adhere to this MIND diet appear to, um, what they have a lower rate of cognitive decline. There are also things you should avoid in order to protect your cognition. If you know people that you're going to have a negative interaction with, just avoid them, all right? Because having negative social interactions is, is associated with a faster rate of memory loss and a greater risk of Alzheimer's dementia. One study out of Sweden showed that frequent but unsatisfactory interactions with one's children increase the risk of dementia. Other risk factors for dementia, people who get angry and stay angry, people who socially isolate themselves, and people who are lonely. Staying active is important. Researchers had 1,000 participants wear an actigraph, similar to a pedometer, on their wrist, as they did everything from exercising to playing cards to cooking. And they found that those in the bottom 10% who moved the least were more than twice as likely to later be diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And don't be a homebody. Rush researchers tested the life space of 1,300 participants, seeing how often they left their bedroom, their house, their neighborhood. Four years of data showed those most confined to their homes were twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's. Stay active, stay connected in deep relationships, eat well. Learn a second language and take music lessons. Avoid negative relationships. Explore new places. Have a purpose in life. Answers like this come from teams of researchers working together on a global level. One of the things that's really, really important is bringing people together from different perspectives that have different knowledge bases and are keeping up with different aspects of evolving science and technologies because all of this really comes together. Emory does the proteomics in the study, measuring all the proteins in the brain. It's an important part of the research sequence that creates a deeper understanding of dementia. I do think that the prevention space is the place that we're going to make real progress, all right? Um, and, and that's what we've seen in all other chronic diseases. After we stain them... We right now, to... Bennett and his team are growing stem cells from participants' skin with the goal of creating targeted drugs. We're finding genes and then proteins that are associated with a slower rate of decline, okay? To get that, if, to find out whether those genes or proteins are druggable, I need to grow those cells, target those genes and proteins to see if it alters a readout of resilience. And if you can find those, okay, then you can move the next step of figuring out what part of the protein, all right, and what you're actually targeting and then, and then, and then work towards actually creating a drug. There's a level, I think, of peacefulness, of, of prayerfulness, of um, appreciation of God in our lives that is contentment. Today, for instance, is the Feast of St. James, and my reflection is um, you have to be a servant to the other. They've made a profound commitment to science. Faith has led them to help others long after their lives on Earth end. I feel that Jesus was the, the representative of God on Earth here, and uh, he would have done it. I'm sure he would have done it.